Hi, welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Harmony, and I'm here with Russell Kay. You know, I um, I only just woke up like 15 minutes ago, <laughs> and um, this is one of those uh, uh, almost live Sunday morning podcasts where it's Sunday morning and um, it's it's what it's nine o'clock. Yeah, and um, you've told me. This is, you, you've told me that uh, we're going to do a podcast. Now, you did tell me before, but did, it is something of a, of a shock and a surprise. It's not a shock or a surprise. But I, I am very, <laughs> um, very much, I'm very quickly getting to know our guest today. I know, and we have a beautiful guest today. Ellen Johansson. Yes, Ellen Johansson, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Good, where um, are you this morning? Well, it's not morning anymore. It's about five o'clock here and I'm in uh, Oslo enjoying the summer here between the rain showers, but uh, it's actually still warm and it's beautiful and we have light until late, late in the evening, like around 10 o'clock. So this is oh. really the time we enjoy. Yeah. Hard to go to sleep though for the, for a yoga teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i love the summers <laughs> with the light mm -hmm. <laughs> us too in canada we have like the early morning with the mm -hmm. sun coming up at 4 35 and then yeah. doesn't go down till 10 30 then, 11 and then you go to work <laughs> and people are still partying yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly yeah. you know yeah. at first blush you remind me of of one of these wood nymphs that maybe you <laughs> see in Game of Thrones, and you, okay. you know, one of the the northern the northern um, uh, spirits that kind of kind of flit through the forest and <laughs> and um, maybe they kill uh, unwary travelers, you know, with like mm. little little spears, <laughs> little blow darts, blow like darts, in yeah, like in Willow, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, are you uh, are you a wood nymph or a <laughs> wood spirit of some kind? It's funny you ask me that because I I was thinking of that coming in today. I had been out cycling and I came in and I thought, hmm, I think I really have a connection to nature. I don't often talk about it because I'm not someone who, you know, goes for long trekking walks and wilderness expeditions. But uh, but nevertheless, you know, nature and especially my connection to a, a place in the countryside where I spent my childhood was was very powerful and very um, spiritual in a way. It was like uh, this place that was specially alive to me and actually healed me once in my life and during a very hard <laughs> period in, of my of my life. So I guess I, I do have a connection to uh, to nature. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I always felt like very free there in uh, mm -hmm. out in, in nature. And I kind of always also had this longing to have a kind of more simple life, like uh, to be like an, an Indian, I mean, a red Indian mm -hmm. or something. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, you know, live in a teepee and close to nature. Or something yeah, like that. yeah. <laughs> And I guess my childhood, you know, these were the days where we were still allowed to run wild in the forest and nobody was looking after us and no bicycle helmets and not so much protection. Mm -hmm. So I we can know. be we could be out and, and use the nature and go a bit wild, you know. Yeah. yeah. You lose a couple of kids now and then. But yeah, there <laughs> yeah, was a well, better time. <laughs> well, I don't I don't think we we lose lost more kids then than than we do now, and now? for other reasons. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I agree. They try to yeah. protect us here in Norway. You know, when I grew up, skateboarding was actually prohibited here. Oh, oh wow. my goodness! For good reason, yeah. I'd say. Because yeah, <laughs> it was kids. dangerous, or no, because no, those it, are, like those are naughty like, kids. Increase, the, skate, yeah. the skateboarders are naughty. Increase yeah, I guess so. <laughs> they were the bad ones, you know. Yeah, so we yeah. had to oh we had to protect the public. You have to root them out. <laughs> Protect the public against yeah. skateboarders. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, there's something so, I, I love that. So healing about nature. And I think especially the last, you know, the last couple of years with COVID and, and mm. you know, so much online, everything, I feel like mm. a lot of us are really craving that connection more again. Mm. But that happened here, actually, because everything was closed. People were spending the outdoors. Uh, they were they were using yeah. the the outdoor 
facilities, suddenly people were ice skating with their kids again, you know. Oh, amazing. So it was nice to see and people were picnicking and, and spending more time outdoors because that's the only place. <laughs> that was the only yeah. place. <laughs> Yeah, I would. I would. I would argue that almost nothing has changed for me. No, <laughs> except that I don't have to go outside, which was <laughs> never never my preference. You just so this, shelter in home. This constantly. Is, that's where I prefer to be <laughs> is just at home. And now I don't have to go outside anymore, and so it's fantastic. Except for the four walks a day with the dog. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that is a disturbance. So I I wanted to to ask you. You you mentioned it just briefly about um this disaster in your childhood and mm -hmm. i think you you grew up outside of oslo your parents mm. were pharmacists and so there's mm. maybe something quite tame and suburban about your childhood mm. that you you says you said that you despised and hated yeah yeah and, hated it <laughs> and i was you, writing it and what flashed through my mind was this like uh, teenage movies you know with the with yeah. the uh, misfit teenager that is kind of oh, uh, seeking him or herself and uh, the, yeah. the whole neighborhood is like a caricature of uh, of just establishment mm -hmm. and you can't fit in and I guess I felt a little bit like uh, like that but people here are so narrow-minded it seemed like mm -hmm. uh, the theme of my life for, for mm -hmm. from very early on I want to get out of here mm -hmm. yeah and you had you felt more free when you were in the country with your grandparents and yeah stuff. yeah we had like uh, my grandparents were or my grandfather was luckily a school teacher so he had a very long summer holiday uh -huh. and then we yeah. could get away and be out in uh, in nature on the on mm -hmm. the countryside and mm -hmm. uh, be on the farm and just run around and uh, and don't have any rules and we didn't have to wash or anything like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's my preference there's actually no it's option wrong. to wash mm -hmm. no, no. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just the hose. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, exactly. So and you know that depended on the weather if it was warm enough for outdoor exactly. showers. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Wow. He wasn't a, a strict disciplinarian as a as a teacher. He well, was he quite was free actually. Yeah, he. I think he was strict to his uh, his students, but uh, but not so much uh, to us. And we yeah. there was anyway plenty of space where we could just run away. And I learned very quickly not to ask. <laughs> for permission to do anything you know you better not yeah. ask the adults can i do this you just do it ask afterwards. yeah and yeah ask for forgiveness <laughs> i always love that yeah. that saying mm. <laughs> don't ask for permission ask for forgiveness <laughs> yeah. not so that it. is harmony's way of life yeah <laughs> hmm. i'm i'm interested in this in what you said as well that maybe you preferred being with your grandparents maybe your parents weren't um, were they not getting along? You described it as maybe dysfunctional. Yeah, a bit dysfunctional. I think not a very uh, uh, generous or nice way of communicating at all, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of accusation and screaming. And what I have later, you know, learned is kind of a dysfunctional way of, of being together, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. taking responsibility for your own moods. And that's uh, what I yeah. think uh, bugged me about adults so much. I, mean, I was thinking like, you're supposed to be the adults. Mm -hmm. You know, you should take charge of your, of your emotions and feelings and not just let them out on, on everyone who comes in your way. You know, you guys mm -hmm. should be in control. Yeah. And I think that's what, uh, what uh, drove me to, to long for something else, for something uh, more noble than, than this way of just behaving and, and letting it all out mm -hmm. but yeah people around me they were like that not very uh, I guess yeah not very uh, um, sophisticated in in that way or, or mm -hmm. lack of self-control I think yeah. yeah I mean what of course first... later I later yeah. I figured out that my mom had a full job and three children so I can understand <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. she was I going guess crazy I was <laughs> more judgmental when I was a, a kid or a teenager yeah <laughs> yeah what was your first like um glimpse at at a different way of being in the world mm. I think I was uh, I was drawn to kind of uh, Christianity and religion and 
uh, I saw that, well, these people seem to be more calm or in more control mm -hmm. and they seem to have a, uh, an alternative way of living. Uh, I mean, like serious, like a nunnery or, or, or a, mm -hmm. a monastery or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that seemed very, very interesting to me. And, and uh, I, I had this idea of, uh, you know, yogis in the East and, uh, and yeah, different lifestyles and also artists. I had an idea that, you know, artists, they had a kind of bohemian lifestyle. They didn't follow mm -hmm. rules and I wanted to be mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Very often those artists had very wealthy families. <laughs> yeah, that's also true. That's also true. We have some of them here in Norway as well. It, yeah. It gives you enormous confidence <laughs> when you have that. That's you have a big pad of money to fall back. Yeah, on. yeah, with Van Gogh, Van Gogh's brother is quite wealthy, you know. Like yeah, that's, gloss over that's that. true. That's <laughs> true. But <laughs> also, you know, being born in Norway, I quickly discovered is kind of like being born with a silver spoon in your mouth. How so? Because we do have a good, uh, we have free education, we have a good social system, so you can mm -hmm. actually, uh, you can actually take some more risks, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what I wanted to do. I thought, well, even if I pursue a, an impossible career, I'm not going to end up starving in some ditch. I can always mm -hmm. get a job and get paid decently. I can always get by. It's not yeah. never going to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. yeah. My mother yeah. said the same thing to me about being a white male. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they always have yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so when you graduated from school, you decided to go and study dance. Yeah, I did that. I had the graduated. Had... No, no, she was eleven. She was 11? A, she was a little oh. girl when she started. Yeah, dancing. yeah. Then I, I started yeah. dancing when I was eleven at a at the local ballet school. And uh, that was already kind of a parallel universe for me. I discovered that I loved performing and taking on roles and, and mm -hmm. being someone else. And, uh, and we got to perform a lot. I must say it was a really good school and a fantastic lady who, who led it. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then when I, when I finished uh, high school, I, I decided to give it a shot. And I also wanted yeah desperately to get away mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah I, I took one term at university just to prove that I wasn't stupid that I could yeah. go to university if I kind mm -hmm. of wanted yeah. so I took the entrance exams and studied some uh, well it was a basic course in philosophy at that time that you had mm -hmm. to pass so I took that and then whoop, I was off to London Wow! Yeah. Did you have to audition down. to get oh, in? Oh yeah, or did we you had to audition there with like to... number plates on our chest, yeah. and uh, <laughs> we had to dance in front of a panel of very serious-looking yes. old dance mistresses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, that was uh, yeah that was a proper audition in those days. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. You look like you have the right frame for it. Uh, Not really. I don't. I don't have the right the open hips in the in the right way so i i never really oh. fit into the to the ballet thing but it was kind mm. of a dream also to to live within that world i was kind of totally a parallel universe the romantic ballets and yeah. just work hard and basically you don't, i i assumed you didn't have to have a social life and deal with people you could just dance and get exhausted and go home and sleep and go back and dance the next day and to me that sounded wonderful that was my dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. i love that too but actually it, it was yeah. it was not the case <laughs> Well, it was not the case. I, I think I wasn't cut out to be a, a dancer and I was already um, 18 or 19 when I started. I, and you should have your debut at 16 or something, you know. It's, no. it's very, it's uh, very difficult. Tough that. And it, it was a very authoritative school, but I felt a lot of freedom just moving out of Norway and, and the place mm -hmm. I lived and coming to London. And, hoo -hoo, nobody knows me here. Yeah. I can do what I want. So yeah, that was a great sense of uh, of liberty to can, to move out from here. Can I just say that I just remembered I had the weirdest dream this just this <laughs> last night this morning. Uh, I was with another a, a couple of other young men, and we were all comparing our turnout. Yeah, yeah, and my that turnout. Happens. 
and my turnout is enormous and it's all very natural and I'm a terrible dancer and I'm yeah. but I have this enormous turnout and, and uh I've always it always Especially sort of in your dream I've always sort of no I it's wide open and I'm, I'm just very I was always very confused why people would say oh my hips weren't open I didn't I, I don't have a turnout like well why don't you just learn learn a better turnout you know mm. Like one of those, but some of it has to do with the way that the femur is actually like uh, socketed. Yeah, in the yeah. hip yes. itself, like it's yeah. structural. Wow, was that true and, for you, Ellen? And in the proper ballet schools in in Russia and stuff, I've heard mm -hmm. that when the kids are really small, they just pop their hips. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But when they're small, they do stuff. Well, yeah, I yeah, there's they, certain things you can do to change yeah, the bone structure yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're young yeah. because your bones are still a little bit soft. My brother must have done that to me. Then, <laughs> Maybe. You know, yeah. But we figure. Okay. And so you were dancing in London, and mm -hmm. and how did you come across yoga? Was it in London at this time in your life? It was actually, yeah. and uh, it was this like turn of faith, I think uh because i i had just it was just the very week of our uh, graduation from the from london contemporary dance school that is as it was called and then i saw this strange man sitting in the canteen and it was danny paradise <laughs> oh, no wow. yeah. really yeah <laughs> and, and one of my classmates she said wow i just met this amazing yoga teacher you guys you have to try and we chipped in a quid each and Danny oh, Paradise good. gave us some like yoga lessons, Ashtanga yoga Fantastic. lessons. Wow. And, a quid and he, is I remember him just sitting there with his like long $2. hair and big eyes. And then he showed me some pictures of himself with his leg behind the neck. And I and he yeah. was he was he was saying like, Yeah, guys, this this method is really, really powerful. This yoga is really, really powerful, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember I just noted it down and, and I kept it in a book and I just practiced it like ever since I didn't know it was a shtanga or what it was. Wow. That's I just knew amazing. I loved it and I loved the, the breathing and I don't know what it how I, I just loved the way it felt. So That's I guess what I noted down was just the standing sequence. Mm -hmm. so I kept yeah. practicing that for a long time without even knowing it was a shtanga. That's yeah. phenomenal, Ellen. I think th the same year, that was like 1993, 94, was it? Uh, 90, yeah, 90, uh, 89, I think. Yeah, 80, 89. 89. Okay, because yeah. it, it said here that you started Ashtanga in 94. Yeah. Um, but you that class was in 89. Yeah. Okay. So it was uh, a long gap. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a long gap, uh, and then later I went to to Amsterdam, and I did completely opposite from this like authoritative uh, English Royal Academy of Dance and Graham yeah. technique, the very expressionist uh, modern dance technique from the thirties or forties. Uh, I came to Amsterdam, where it was like all somatic uh, exploration yeah. and, yeah. and concept yeah. composition very conceptual mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. um and uh, uh yeah i was sort of i had one foot in each uh, uh camp i guess uh and then my, but anyhow i started dancing with a with an american choreographer and uh, we went on we went on tour to uh, to um, New York. We went to have oh, some wow. performances in New York, and I met uh, Tim Feldman and his yeah. uh, former wife Sarah, who was also a dancer. Yeah. And she took yeah. me to Jiva Mukti. She took me to uh, to my first like proper wow. yoga wow. lesson in the yoga studio. She said, wow. "This is the cool thing. This is where all the dancers go now. They just forget about dance classes. Everyone goes to yoga." Oh, <laughs> Tim! And yeah. was that was that in '94? Then was that was that? Yeah, that was '94. So okay. that was much uh, that was much later. Maybe yeah, because I, 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 I was thinking I was I was I had a little ballet course and I was and I just you just meet this Ashtanga yogi. Mm -hmm. I met this Ashtanga yogi in Chicago just randomly, and like that's how it was. You just you had to be like the most lucky coincidence mm. to run to like 
you know, bump into a yoga teacher in those, mm. those days. It was <laughs> yeah. very, I can't stress this enough for our younger it? listeners, <laughs> how uncommon it was to meet a yeah. yoga teacher. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we had, mm. You have to be one of the luckiest people <laughs> on <laughs> earth to suddenly like, oh, yeah. an Ashtanga yeah. yoga teacher it happens <laughs> yeah. to be at my university or in my canteen. It's just yeah, exactly. Really. <laughs> That's amazing. And when you went to your first Jiva Mukti mm. class, did you kind of recognize the the style? Yeah, I realized. I realized this is this is what I had been doing. This was the Ujjayi breathing, and this was right. the technique. Yeah. So at that time, they also had the Shtanga classes at uh, at Jiva Mukti. Yeah. Uh, so I went to all the classes there. I just loved it. I loved the. Also, I felt so. Uh, um, connected or in my right element because mm -hmm. Sharon and David uh, David they was a former performance artist so yeah. they, mm -hmm. it was very yeah. spiritual but also in a very very free way yeah perfect uh, for you so, mm -hmm. <laughs> perfect. yeah it was it was perfect <laughs> but it yeah. was a hard discipline as well you know yeah they were fierce those teachers yeah. yeah yeah for sure perfect <laughs> so, Actually, so yeah. I liked everything about that it was challenging it was fierce I remember they put me up in one of the classes I I hadn't done so much yoga and they put me in this what is it called Viparita Shalabhasana where you're on your chest uh -huh. the third series oh pose, yes in oh. Yeah. and they just left me there <laughs> like, nice. <what> is this? <laughs> amazing yeah. yeah there's always a seduction as a teacher is to take a talented student and and show them off and play with their bodies in public and like look look what we can do with this town student <laughs> and then like the middle-aged people in the class is like oh this is exciting uh, we should <laughs> do more of this yeah it's um it is it is um i think an indulgence from the teacher when we <laughs> we we end up we find ourselves doing this but it's um yeah yeah um, so how long were you in new york for I was there. Actually, I went back and I spent a month there, and uh, and then mm -hmm. I I um, and that time, oh no, no people, they don't go. There's no Ashtanga anymore at Jiva Mukti now. Everyone goes to Eddie Stern, South of Eddie, yeah, that's right. To Eddie Stern. So I spent a month. Uh, I spent a month there, and wow, loved it. Yeah. Was it all right? Because at that time, I was I I I understood that it was getting through the door into his class and being able to get to the mat was an ordeal mm. just because of the hoops that you had to cross uh, or jump through the you had to kind of prove yourself to him to get into the room was that your experience no, that, that yeah. was not an issue i found him and jocelyn they were very friendly yeah. it was really it was very nice okay. it was also yeah. this just this big room on yeah. Broadway, and you just took the elevator up. There was a there was a, a guard in the uniform and <laughs> on the yeah. ground floor, and you said, mm -hmm. "I'm going to yoga," and you went up, no. and you just opened the door, and yeah, you just amazing. got this wall of sweaty air coming yeah. through, wow. you and this yeah. loud, loud breathing, and you had to quietly go to a corner and and hang your clothes next to the businessman suit and the briefcase that was there yeah. and then you had to just grab a space it was like Amazing. it was like it did it it was such an impression on a gut impression that to see mm -hmm. that whole room you know moving in like slow motion coming mm -hmm. in from the street of new york that yeah. was amazing yeah. yeah yeah like entering like a like a, like a truly kind of sacred space, like something that's so different from the normal world. I always yeah. really love that about like a Mysore room when it's going, it just feels like like a alternate universe in a sense, yeah, something totally so different. different yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Something that you mentioned that was happening for you at this time that was really, it was uh, um, uh, salacious uh, that I'd like to ask you about. You said at this time that there was a, a scandal back home in Norway. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that, that was, was earlier. Yeah, that was part of what kind of drove you away from Norway and and wanted to go towards dance and and mm -hmm. yoga. And I wonder, can can you talk about it at all about all of these these lawsuits and all these things that your mm -hmm. family was wrapped into? Yeah, it was just something everyone got uh, wrapped into, and. Uh, uh, and of course, that 
took all the attention. So so we as children, I was 14 at the time, I think 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. So we were three children, but and we were just, I felt we were just like forgotten, you know, every, all the energy went into this. We want to prove our, like, we want to win this, we want to prove our innocence and all that. Mm -hmm. So, and it just dragged on. It's very different from a, from a, you know, court drama where they, you know, they have a, an argument and the lawyer comes and then you win the case and whew, you're free and you can go. You know, it's years. Uh, it's not like that at all. <laughs> it <drags laughs> out year yeah. after year after year yeah. and the lawyer bills come and you don't know, mm -hmm. oh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so every all the energy went uh, went into that and uh, and uh, yeah, it was a yeah, it was a pretty big thing. It was, you know, in the media and everything and I just withdrew. I didn't mm. want to, anyone to know. I just withdrew from my my friends, and I uh, I became I think anorectic. I stopped eating. Mm. I I had to have some kind of control because I couldn't yeah. control anything around me. So uh, so I went into dancing. That was a safe place for me at that time. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, and also it became a a, a route out of. Uh, out of Norway and away from everything. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. at that time I, I just and it also made me, you know, it was this was in the 80s and at the same time where when this thing was happening, I saw everyone around me, my classmates, they wanted to be like stockbrokers or businessmen, right. mm -hmm. make a lot of money, and that was all they were interested in. And I was mm -hmm. like, how can you why? You know, yeah. <laughs> you can do anything in the world, and you want to do that. You want to you know, go study. I don't know. I guess some people find it interesting, but uh, uh, I, I, I lost very much faith in any kind of uh, security or society or mm -hmm. uh, uh, legal system and mm -hmm. anything like yeah. that. I thought I have to find, I have to find my safe place elsewhere. Yeah. forgive me for asking and we can we can not talk about it but it's, was it a kind of thing where like your family was trying to prove their innocence or your family was trying to secure some some something that had been stolen from them or? no no it wasn't uh, um it wasn't something that had been uh had been stolen it was like a, a yeah proper like a criminal case oh, mm -hmm. accusation okay yeah, okay, yeah. Wow. Terrible. Wow. Yeah, it was totally devastating. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting. You also, you mentioned, it just kind of uh, off the cuff, you were talking about yoga and Mysore, and, and then it says here, and I was, I'd spent three years living in a monastery. <laughs> and it was quite a, quite a sudden jump, but it, it strikes me again as a kind of safe, space for you yeah it kind if... of uh, it kind of happened that way it wasn't uh, it wasn't so much uh, uh, planned or it was planned in a certain way but it, it just faith just took a different uh, direction so this again happened in uh, in Mysore that I met some American Buddhists so uh, you were in New then, York and you had taken a trip to Mysore to study yeah I, I was in this was um, in 2005 I think yeah 2005 yeah, yeah. so I was in uh, I was in Mysore and I met this uh, I met these Buddhists Americans mm -hmm. and one of them was a was a nun and she was just out of three-year retreat and I, I found it so fascinating you know mm -hmm. yeah taking a break from everything spending three years how cool and i could see how, <laughs> how her mind was you know yeah and, mm. uh, and she didn't talk to anyone before one o'clock in the in the afternoon that was her wow. time to observe the mind paradise like, wow that's yeah. kind of radical <laughs> <laughs> and then i started looking into the you know the buddhist philosophy and reading texts with her and and doing mm. courses and and stuff and i thought wow and by the way, that was always what attracted me to to India. Mm. It was it impressed me more to to get into the the Yoga Sutras and and being in a culture when where everyone had this idea of you know karma and 
cause and effect yeah. and it matters what you do and mm-hmm. and you try to do something to affect the outcome of things you know in a mm-hmm. totally different non-materialistic way mm-hmm. yeah like in a kind of uh, in a in a spiritual way or in a devotional way or or mm-hmm. um, uh, something something like that so uh, mm-hmm. uh, so that was very that was very powerful uh, and uh, uh, I hadn't really looked into to Buddhism, but uh, I was I was fascinated by the Yoga Sutras, but it didn't really provide me with a path mm-hmm. how to practice these things, you know, how to go from A to B and and progress on uh, on a path. So I was really fascinated by these uh, by the Buddhist teachings that I found very 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 practical mm. uh, and. Uh, well, they they resonated with me, and uh, and uh, I planned to go to to their monastery in the in the states. So I I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. I want to learn this. I'm gonna spend. Uh, I'm gonna take uh, six months off. I can't remember what I had planned. A year or six months. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go to the states. I'm gonna stay there. And then I happened to uh, while I was in Mysore, I happened to meet this uh, Rinpoche, this Tulku that they took me to and wow, mm. I just felt so oh, here was something <laughs> connection so yeah. suddenly I, I changed my mind and I asked him if he would uh, if he would teach me and he said yeah and I asked well what 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 do you what do you want to teach me what should I do and he just said well you should come to my monastery mm-hmm. oh not what I expected but I don't know, <laughs> maybe I don't go to the states maybe I go to you know Bella Cooper to Mysore instead yeah so wow. that's what i ended up doing and and spending time there wow but you had you had been to my store for the first time in 1997 right yeah yeah in guruji's old shala yeah in lakshmi forum yeah. and then did you keep going or did you take some time away no i had a long uh, i had a long break actually i didn't intend to go back mm-hmm. and it was only when i i did um I did a uh, teacher training with John Scott and he mm-hmm. okay. he was so devoted to Guruji and and uh, yeah. uh, and said well you should go to my so you should go again you know mm-hmm. yeah. and then I thought well I'll I'll give it a shot I'll go back uh, and that time then then Guruji was already in his 90s Mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. but he so was that still... was 2005 when you returned yeah, yeah but the second time. so i went Good back girl. twice more when yeah. when guruji was still uh, teaching yeah mm-hmm. with his like amazing energy yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and what did you do in between like from 1997 to 2005 were you still dancing or were you doing i was working I was doing, some, somewhere else yeah i was doing both i had uh, yeah. i had the kind of smooth transition into yoga i was still mm-hmm. uh, i was still dancing but uh, i was always dancing freelance so it was always project to project okay. and i was so happy to find yoga to have more of a, a stable job mm-hmm. and a stable income and i discovered that i really really liked teaching and mm-hmm. i could use so much of the of the knowledge from from dancing in my yoga teaching so it wasn't really a big uh, it wasn't really a big difference but it, difference but i thought it, it's a simple method to teach you know that mm-hmm. the simple framework to use for yeah. uh, uh, to, to apply your knowledge and uh, yeah knowledge about uh, physicality and and movement into that Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. i was of course i was also it also had a big effect on me to to practice yoga Mm -hmm. it was a whole different way of being in the body and it's kind of strange because i had been a dancer for a long time yeah and uh, you should think that you had access to your own body and you have in a certain way but you're always like doing things you're always telling your body what to do and learn mm-hmm. new steps and tricks and stuff and uh mm-hmm. in the shtanga i think i think it's different you also receive so much information from your from your body it's a totally different way of, of being with your body and with your breath mm-hmm. yeah i love that um that that shift that you just highlighted of like like one is like a lot of energy output where you're telling your body what to do but then the yoga is more like receiving that input and understanding, mm. you know, what's actually going on in your body. 
And I always felt like dance kind of was more about ignoring what was going on in your body <laughs> to like overcome something, right? To overcome the obstacle. Whereas mm. yoga is really about paying attention so that you can, you know, maybe dissolve the obstacle or, mm. or listen to it or, you know, understand it better. Yeah. It's both actually, because with mm. the, in contemporary dance, you certainly do a lot of somatic work to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to discover new movement. You don't want to yeah. repeat anything. You're always like discovering new movement, new movement possibility, and you <laughs> facilitate movement through uh, increased uh, body awareness. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very short step from from doing that to get into a. Uh, a spiritual uh, practice but I think yeah. again you have to do it very deliberately mm -hmm. otherwise it's a body that you have uh, access to but you're not uh, mm -hmm. directing it towards any like, spiritual yeah. aim yeah mm -hmm. and so when you went to s to stay at the monastery that was in Bala Coupe, just outside yes. of Mysore yeah yeah wow in 2005 yeah and uh, yeah. so the whole time that Harmony and I were just like <laughs> screwing around, going to Janaki's and eating lunch and then, like sleeping all day, sleeping you were over there day. and by the coupe just like meditating. I didn't meditate. That's kind of an impression we have of uh, Buddhism. I was actually yeah. looking for meditators in the uh, in the monastery, but uh, I think it's a, one assumption we have that uh, that Buddhists sit and meditate so much. What they, <laughs> what they do in the in the monastery is like uh, certainly like the the Golden Temple is really a huge learning uh, institution where mm. they maintain the the huge body of of uh, of scriptures and mm. and teachings from the buddhist tradition uh, and they're educating people who can who can teach that and and pass it on to the next generation and they are of course also performing huge uh, tantric uh, pujas that take mm. days and days to to perform and are very very complex so it's a it's an institution that educates experts in in ritual and in mm -hmm. scripture i would say and then you know it also works like you know some uh, a lot of people just maintain do the practical things so it's really all kind of uh, all kind of uh, uh, jobs you can say or, or a lot of cleaning yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cleaning. yeah. 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 <laughs> rubbing the and so, tiles outside the yeah. temple i've seen that <laughs> yeah so yeah. your presence there in by how are how are you dressed i mean are you in the 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 saffron robes as well are you no, is I wasn't your head ordained, shaved you see i never took yeah. ordination i i never wanted really to be a nun uh, mm -hmm. so but i was decently dressed in you know in the <laughs> kutras or in the chupa yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah long and skirts. then yeah you're in a dormitory and you're kind of are you with the 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 nunnery and you're in that no you see all all monasteries will have guest houses because they mm -hmm. frequently have people visiting and they have sponsors visiting so so they have to put them somewhere so they usually have guest houses where lay people mm -hmm. or visiting people can can stay yeah for a uh, for a relative small amount of money yeah uh, but i never lived there i uh, i actually rented a room in the camp nearby so i live ah. right next to the monastery okay with along with a lot of exile uh, tibetans it yeah. was yeah. really such a lovely place it was so nice yeah, yeah. amazing and that part of india so it, it was in many way a, a, a blissful time mm. um, i've i've spent a, i've since we both have visited quite often um mm. I, I i've spent the night there a few times and it was i remember the the linen was uh, uncomfortable <laughs> linen <laughs> well i had my the, own so I oh, you brought your own linen that's I had my yeah. own yeah yeah that's an <laughs> excellent ad mm. advice Wow. And so you, you spent three years in the camp and then you would yeah, go to of, the... Kind of on and off. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I, I went back to Norway to, to work. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would teach. I, was, I still had a, a yoga studio. So I would teach for a few months. I would go back. I would stay there. Uh, and then we would go to Budgaya every year for the prayer festivals Amazing. and long teachings. 
uh, mm -hmm. and for practice so we had to do all these like uh, hundred thousand prostrations and stuff mm -hmm. like that it took a long time wow. um, and uh, I was allowed to sit in on uh, on the Tibetan yoga for one year they did like a month retreat of that once and I was doing practical things like they had a little clinic for the children in the monastery so I was you know, pretending to help out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pretending. <laughs> well, I'm not a nurse, you see, so right. I did my best. Yeah. yeah. I remember, there was like a health, um, a, health patting, a health clinic. Lot of, a lot of patting little children on the head and yeah. Yeah. them with scabies oh. medicine. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Oh. I, I heard a comic say something about this once, but uh, uh, about young people, you know, 20 year olds who, who, who go away on a mission to, uh, to volunteer and help out in some third world country. Mm. And the idea of that is, is a hundred is 180 degrees opposite of what you think. Like that young person was being taken care of by the people there. <laughs> yeah. They weren't taking care of the people there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's, mm, it's an amazing exchange, though, isn't it? When when you enter another culture or another like discipline, and and I mean, you always yeah, absolutely. you might I'm, be there to give in a certain way, but you also receive so much. Of mm -hmm. course, you receive so much, and uh, it was a good experience to see uh, how it works. You know, when mm -hmm. when people with the same intention live together and. Uh, these are the things you also it also helped i think for my later studies when i when i studied uh, when i did buddhist studies and, and tibetan language more formally i could mm. understand the setting within which these teachings were given and what it referred to uh, so yeah i thought i thought that was uh, that was helpful yeah, and of course, you know, I liked it was also kind of a, a retreat. I also had my Ashtanga practice. I, I would yeah. do that and I would study Tibetan and I would do my prayers and yeah, um, study on my own. And yeah, I had no problem with passing time <laughs> like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> I could easily be an internal, eternal student. Yeah. It's uh, our friend uh, John Campbell had also yes. spent a lot of time. Mm. I wonder if you rubbed shoulders with him while you while you were there. I did. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, first time I was in Mysore, I met him there actually in '97, yeah. mm -hmm. the year when he met his wife. Yeah, he was Claude. Also there. Yeah. This yeah. Artist. Yeah. 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 I was very I impressed with her. You know. Yeah. I knew I knew Claude from New York. She had. Um, she had lectured at my university in the mm -hmm. arts and uh, uh, she was quite aggressively territorial with me. And <laughs> I always tease her about that. I also, I also like to tease John that um, before I had met John, I had seen his, his wife naked because um, she was a performance artist and she would, she had done yes, a, like yeah. a really I interesting was, yeah. presentation where she had, she was on stage and she had uh unraveled. unraveled her dress over a period of a week and then <laughs> sewn it back together and it was like it was incredible, yeah I, incredible. she showed us pictures of her performances and she had one she spent a, a week or something in bed with a motorbike yeah. wow <laughs> <laughs> i was i was very impressed with that because she was also very young and very successful artist yeah yeah, yeah that's uh, yeah. challenging yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I liked about, I really liked about John is his, his ability to kind of weave together Buddhism and his study of, uh, of Tibetan culture and, and his Ashtanga yoga practice. And I, I wonder if you could also speak to that experience for yourself, because mm -hmm. it, it was, I think for a lot of us, it was a kind of fantasy land to go over to Baila Kupe and and think about these traditions and and you know imagine ourselves kind of being more more authentic and i it strikes me that the you were much more deeply immersed in that experience than us and it's it's kind of incredible well it it kind of was confusing for me for a long time as well cuz mm. uh, uh i had like one leg in uh, in what i thought was the buddhist camp and one in yeah. the ashtanga camp and i didn't understand where these 
uh, traditions would would meet or where they would cross paths mm -hmm. but then you know having learned more about it and and educated myself in the you know history of yoga and history of uh, of buddhism i see that it's really uh, a much um uh, later uh, division of where mm. these paths actually were seen as a, as two different paths. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you go back to, and I, when I talk about yoga, I think of yoga as you know two uh, kind of phases. You have the early classical yoga of, of Patanjali, and then you have mm -hmm. the late tantric tradition, and and both of them have, uh, both of them have. Uh, a, in both of them, you see the, the traditions uh, coming together or emerging from the same source, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the, the classical yoga and classical Buddhism, I mean, they were, it's both <laughs> Patanjali and the Buddha yeah. are both practicing yoga. And I think even uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, it was classified as a darshana later as a philosophical system but it's much more a description of a of a collection of methods that were mm -hmm. uh, prevalent at the time they were mm -hmm. uh, collected and they cross over many different traditions so what is described in the yoga sutras is also what the buddhists were practicing what the jains mm -hmm. were practicing so yeah. uh, to to the the label as a, one of the philosophical systems was attached really much later and you see mm -hmm. the same if you go later you see in uh, also in, in uh, tantra that the there was a common there was a common uh, use of the of the of the body there was a common concept of the body the subtle body the winds and the channels mm -hmm. and they also have a they also have a, a common source it just developed differently because uh, then buddhism was um, imported to uh, tibet and, and developed further there whereas it uh, uh, it uh, over time vanished or was absorbed into other traditions i would rather say in uh, in india mm -hmm. so if we look at the landscape today it looks like very separate traditions but it's really uh, so yoga is yoga it's a collection of methods yeah. that uh, uh, a yeah. multitude of traditions have uh, been using and applying yeah I love that that you bring that up because in the sutras itself, even some of the words and the language, you can see the Buddhist sort yeah, of yeah, connection or influence a... or Jain connection and influence and how yeah, it's even they were really Buddhist, Buddhist yeah. hybrid Sanskrit is the yeah. it's not common uh, Sanskrit terms even it's taken from from Buddhism. So I think it's pretty clear that he's describing yeah. what people were practicing at the time. Yes. Yeah, different camps. Yeah, before things got so like mm. segregated almost yeah. or categorized. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. It's so lovely. finding out that you know, there's really just <laughs> yoga. Yeah. So yeah. I think no need to differentiate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but it's also you know it's also this later adaptation where you apply the yoga sutras to the physical yoga that we've been doing mm -hmm. for the last maybe two hundred years. Uh, so so that's a new interpretation and a new development yeah. mm -hmm. i'd have to say that i think john was the first person who i've ever heard say that to me that you know when i i in a institutional setting i asked him uh you know what is the difference between meditation and, and yoga and you know how do you how do you um integrate the two and he said you know if you if you're really examining the material it's impossible to differentiate yes. mm. meditation and yoga and it's it's uh it's it's just impossible it is you are using the body to concentrate the, the mind mm. Mm. so you know when we met in Mysore I don't know exactly what year it was but I think you were on your way to live in Nepal oh that must have been late then because i moved to nepal yeah. in 2011 yeah maybe, yeah i don't know if you were exactly directly mm -hmm. on your way but i think mm -hmm. you were kind of thinking of heading mm -hmm. that direction yeah 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 
Yeah, what, I did that. What on, was, I did, yeah, I did, tell us I about that. Several, I did several trips to Nepal uh, before, before I finally, okay. you know, um, enrolled in the university there and, and decided okay. to stay there. Uh, so, no, I had lived in the monastery and I, I was a little bit naive and I thought I could, you know, grasp what Buddhism was by just hanging around in the monastery and <laughs> yeah, I couldn't really so I felt the need for uh, more um, academic studies for more uh -huh. uh, um, uh, what can we say more structure in mm -hmm. my in my studies not just to try to you know learn the language by asking around and, and yeah <laughs> with people and they would they would anyway tell you all kind of different things so yeah. it was very confusing for me to to try to learn the language in in that way because it's also an exile population so they all have yeah. different ways and of um of um, using the language uh so uh, finally i uh uh, I went to uh, I went to uh, Kathmandu to uh, Ramjung Yeshe Institute and I did a, I did two three summer courses I think wow. uh, intensives yeah um, that was a revelation to me okay so they so they would just say like well most people say this and you commonly hear this as well so then I <laughs> yeah aha, aha, yeah so this is how the language works and then and so you were studying to like tibetan language while you were yeah, i went there up to there. study tibetan yeah. language okay and and then i decided to uh, i thought i thought well it might be fun to be a translator for a lama and kind of sit next to him and read yeah. and interpret what he's saying so i decided to to do that uh, for a year yeah, so wow. I think it was probably one of the most intensive years in, in my life. I deliberately decided not to speak to any English speaking persons. Yeah. So I, had like yeah. every, I had like every slot of 15 minutes in the day was accounted for. You know, I didn't take like breaks. I would, you have to learn basically everything by heart. It, Tibetan is not a phonetic language like Sanskrit, where you can mm -hmm. figure out how to spell things pretty much from how right. it sounds. Uh, Tibetan is completely the opposite so you need to actually memorize the spelling of, of every single right. word and it doesn't sound like anything you know yeah. so it wow. was a lot of uh, uh, it was a lot of uh, learning by heart mm -hmm. and uh, I was a little bit worried because I was already in my mid-40s and I was thinking how much can my br old brain really retain of this is it really possible at all yeah. to <laughs> learn a new language at this age so it was a very, uh, very, very intensive year, and and at the end of it, I, I realized that I don't understand what these guys, what these lamas are talking about, because I don't know the <laughs> philosophy. You know, it's so much terminology, <laughs> incredible. It's two thousand five hundred years of you know develop, of developing different terminology and different schools and philosophical yeah. systems, and all that. So. Uh, so I thought I better study the philosophy. So I did a I did a bachelor degree after that. Wow! Uh, in Nepal, also, yeah, wow. the same institution. And then uh, and then someone talked me into stay a bit longer and doing a master degree. So wow! Uh, I also liked staying in Nepal. So yeah, I just continued. And so, was your bachelor's degree and your master's degree in Tibetan language, or was it in philosophy, or it's both? So the the bachelor degree was uh, uh, Buddhist studies and Himalayan languages. So it yeah. was mainly Tibetan. I did a bit of uh, I did a little bit of Sanskrit. It was required for the master's studies. Yeah. Uh, well, I did about a year of uh, of Sanskrit, so a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah and then buddhist uh, studies so we would study both with lamas from the monastery so we would be taught yeah. in a very tra traditional hermeneutic uh, uh yeah. way mm -hmm. yeah and <laughs> and then we would have western scholars with you know their approach and contextualization right. and and uh, um, historical um, um Con contextualization we would have both kind of uh, classes and writing so on one hand was we were taught in a very traditional way where you have to learn everything by heart you have to know what you're going to answer on the on the exam they will ask you like uh, what are the yeah like what are the six parameters describe them and right. there are a lot of lists 
in office yes. systems. <laughs> so you would memorize this and, and, yeah. and you would have to write something about them as well. Uh, and, uh, and in the other classes with the Western scholars, you would write academic papers and in mm -hmm. a more uh, academic style way. So it was really wonderful to have both uh, approaches, mm. uh, the insider and the uh, outsider uh, tradi tradition. When my, when, whereas my master degree was in translation which has oh, okay. also been really helpful. So it was in textual tr translation. We, yeah. uh, we did, you know, translation studies, philology, and this is really helpful when it comes to, you, you know, understanding the yoga tradition to understand what the text, how, how terse a, a classical text actually is mm -hmm. and, and how many choices you have to make when you, when you translate, not just from a language, but also to another culture that might not have mm -hmm. this concepts that you find in the root text yeah uh, could you would you say for example the, like the case, uh, sorry which is heavily the case with the yoga sutras that is yeah so terse, terse. Yeah. yeah that's what i was i was going to ask because that seems like the most the the example that maybe our listeners would would um uh resonate with is that the the text of the patanjali yoga sutras is quite thin and small mm. and yet the interpretations of the the sutras can go on for a thousand pages yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and with many different in books that are their interpretations yeah. of the same text and from many different time periods and uh, mm. uh, even even choices you make when when translating the the text that has affects how it's understood and how it can be interpreted mm -hmm. so there are always layers upon layers and so we were yeah. learning about this you know you have to take some choices you have to make some choices as a as a translator mm. and it was it's very you know interesting because language is our frame of mind you know it is yeah. our world actually we can't we don't see what we don't have uh, words for it's our mm -hmm. world just like the buddhist philosophy and and the yoga philosophy say our world consists of concepts and yoga mm -hmm. is very much the path of dissolving these concepts and yeah. come back to what is beyond the, behind them, beyond them yeah wow yeah incredible and so when you were up there did you start teaching Mysore too is it during this time you were studying yeah, yeah I, could, I thought <laughs> why not you know, I always thought when that was my life plan when I was very yeah. young okay mm -hmm. I kind of knew I couldn't you know I couldn't dance or do physical things uh, all my life so I thought well I'll just try for as long as it goes so well, I have to do it in this order I have to to work with the body first mm -hmm. and then I can work with my mind then I can be an mm -hmm. academic in my old days yeah. that was my that was my plan uh, yeah. and I thought uh, I always envied people who didn't have to you know uh, wake up with a completely stiff body and start all over again to like loosen yeah. up and, and work and get into the groove and it was like you had to wasn't you had to start from scratch every day yeah. that was my experience and then it, in many cases as a as a yogi as well you know it takes yeah. some time before you get into it so I thought ah will be so nice it would be so nice to be an academic and you can just nobody cares you know how you how you uh, look wake up you can just, yeah. you can just sit <laughs> yeah. you can just sit and nobody can s tell if you're concentrating or not they can tell yeah. if you're a yogi or a dancer because you fall down from your yeah. balance or you're, they can tell when you're off it must be so yeah. nice to just you know do something uh, where you don't have to use your body but i couldn't mm -hmm. last for very long you know just trying to be an academic so I, I missed uh, I missed the yoga and I, I started yeah. teaching some classes in uh, in Kathmandu yeah. so at first we had some really nice uh, yoga studios there mm -hmm. uh, and and when they discontinued I was offered uh, to have my own yoga I was actually offered to use a yoga studio so so I just um, I just yeah. used that to and set yeah. up my own MISO program amazing which was which was fun you know yeah. it was very of course as with any MISA program that you start is you have like your three two or three students yeah two or three students to begin with but but then it kind of uh, 
took on and uh, and uh, mm-hmm. I got some students after a while and such a lovely community in uh, mm-hmm. in Nepal of uh, expats and and local mm-hmm. Nepali students and and people who would come to to study with me and stay for a month or two so that Amazing. was it was really really a nice uh, community mm. yeah. yeah I you know I'm I'm, inter- well, I'm interested um I think I've, I've teased our guests before that I that I appear to be fascinated with their romantic lives, and I think it's <laughs> it's because for me, so much of my history seems tied to who I was romantically obsessed with, mm. and that's a period of time. And I, I have I'm having the impression that your life isn't isn't run the same way. Mm. Like you had a you had a spiritual obsession and an interest and a an interest in refuge Mm -hmm. and taking refuge. Um, But I don't see your life being compartmentalized by who you were in love with, which is surprising (laughs) to me. That was not my, uh, that was not my uh, ambition for a Mm -hmm. a long time. And I never thought of having my own family. That was not on on my list, on my Mm -hmm. bucket list Mm -hmm. or or any list. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it was never an attraction for me because I uh, I saw that as just one way of repeating what my parents were doing, mm-hmm. and I didn't really see the uh, appeal in that or any appeal in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so I didn't I didn't pursue that, mm-hmm. uh, and I think somehow getting being so involved in in dancing and in yoga, I always thought, oh, this is enough. I get enough. Uh, physical uh, gratification yeah. from, from being involved in these uh, oops in these practices <laughs> yeah. so but then you know lightning strikes you <laughs> oh, yeah. so yeah. when you when you least plan it you know so yeah. i thought well i moved to Kathmandu i i'm going to withdraw from the world maybe i will be a <laughs> well if not a nun so i will just immerse in this and when you have no expectations then you fall in love yeah hmm. <laughs> so th- that my was life also... has been more like a thunderstorm <laughs> a thunderstorm mm. Mm. <laughs> and so how did mm. how did that happen what happened tell us the story no i just uh i just um uh fell in love with uh with a tibetan man and uh, yeah uh, i think um uh it was it's also you know what the person from from that culture represents in my life Mm. it also (laughs) makes me feel whole in a way that you know you know this thing about living in uh, India that happened to me a lot you know in in one way you feel you feel so at home in this Mm -hmm. uh, in this culture and you think that you have just blended on and then you pass uh, then you pass uh, a window and you see a reflection and you see this white person who completely <laughs> stands Shocked. out like you're the yeah. elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, is this what I it's... look like? I felt yeah. I was starting to feel so at home here. I yeah. thought I had really <laughs> blended in. I speak the language and everything. And still you stand out and you see you're not anywhere close you know yeah i know that so. feeling that looking in the mirror and being surprised by yeah. a white person yeah. it's shocking yeah so so you know but living more closely with the uh, with the person from from that culture which mm. you really love so much yeah uh, it, it makes a difference and it makes me feel more whole you know more mm. safe you know mm-hmm. i have it i have him i have the the culture the whole references the values mm-hmm. i have it close by all the time i don't have to be the one person who living in norway who upholds that view who constantly swims yeah. against the stream you know yeah mm-hmm. yeah so it's such a it's such a support to uh, to just be to be two and to have that reference around you all the time yeah beautiful is he in norway with you now He's in Norway with me now. I've sent him off to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> the cold beach. <laughs> the cold. Yeah, the cold beach. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so no, beautiful. He's, he, yeah, he's been here many times before. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to convince him to uh, <laughs> to move here. And, uh, yeah. But it's also, Why? of course, it's, it's difficult for him to adapt to this culture where nobody talks to each other and there's no, like, hangout places 
like Nepal yeah. is so beautiful. It has all these people boot, which just yeah. means people trees. Yeah. On every crossroad, there's a big tree with like a little shrine and a, a, yeah. a sitting area around it. Mm -hmm. So in one way, you can come there, you can light some incense, offer some threads to the goddess, or you can just sit there and have a cigarette and, and talk to, <laughs> talk to yeah. your neighbor. It's so, so socially uh, rich yeah. in a way mm -hmm. that we, we don't have here. It's very yes. sad in a way. And I always feel sorry mm -hmm. for people who move to Norway that they must be so lonely. You know? But yeah. uh, do you have a dog? I don't have a I don't have a dog and I know it's a it's a good door opener. To, it, it's to a, a dog it's very you know, people with it's dogs very uncomfortable. talk to each other. Yeah, it's yeah. awful. Yeah. You know, I can't stand it. So I have to well, I go out with the dog and then suddenly I'm standing with five people as we watch our dogs play with each other. And I don't know these people at all. And I'm learning all kinds of things about them. It's terrifying. Okay. <laughs> but it is it is interesting. Like I, I always feel that with the um, you know, East Asian or Southeast Asian cultures, there's a lot more um outdoor culture mm -hmm. happening where mm -hmm. people are like hanging out together and you know meeting each other and life is really lived outside yeah. for a lot of time even in colder places it's yeah, still yeah. like lived outside it, it also makes you less materialistic because everything yeah. is is not depending on on what a nice home you have if you can exactly. invite people to your home and what kind yes. of uh, plates and uh, sofa yes. and stuff you have you know it doesn't matter the okay. solution there is not to invite people to your home. Yeah. And then you also to not go outside. People to your home. Mm. Yeah. Just go outside. Go outside. I mean, life <laughs> happens outside, not in your home. Mm. But uh, here, yeah. everything is focused around inside the home. The home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's getting a bit. I mean, it's getting a bit better now. I mean, especially in summer, it's a bit hysterical in Oslo because we can be outside and wow, it's like we discover it every year. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Hanging out. It's actually nice. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very. Um, that's funny. I think that's a very northern experience. Experience because it's very similar here in Canada, yeah. where it's festival season now. Yeah, for yeah. like eight, nine months of the year, we're just sort of inside, and then for three months of the year, we yeah, come yeah, out and, and yeah. enjoy life again. And it's really an experience of impermanence as well. Yeah. You know, because yeah. the weather always changes. Yeah. So you have to kind of grab it. I remember that when yeah. when I moved to uh, when I moved to Asia, and I always had a problem, you know, sitting inside and studying when the sun was shining outside. Yeah. Because I'm brought up, you can't sit in the sun is shining. You don't know how long yeah. it's gonna last. Get That's out. right. Exactly. Yeah. Quick, quick, go. Yeah. Get outside. So I'm I'm confused. Then, like, why would you leave this paradise in Nepal and try and convince your your companion to move back to Norway? <laughs> um that wasn't it wasn't actually planned either it just happened during the pandemic that i thought mm -hmm. i would go home for a couple of months because nepal had been closed for five months yeah mm -hmm. so it was nothing i could do there except retreat mm -hmm. and, uh, everything was uncertain and i had been doing retreat for five months i felt and yeah. i kind of desperately wanted to be able to walk outside and be outdoors and uh, and mm -hmm. have some space around me i guess and but i didn't plan on staying so long but you know then i got home and suddenly two years had passed and things <laughs> yeah. were still closed down uh, so, and so you... meanwhile i had been here and i had been establishing a, a new uh, yoga company and we had lots of plans and things we would do and the MISO program and inviting guest teachers and in-depth course and there was a lot of things that happened during that mm. pandemic which was kind of you know we had a lot of things cooking while things yeah. were just still because we were not going out and teaching all the time yeah. So, so we had a, a lot of time to to prepare. Yeah. Now so that's kind of okay. Now I'm actually fine with staying here, and slowly, slowly, as uh, Nepal opens again, I will do more um, projects there. I will certainly go back to Nepal, but I don't think I will live there for the for the next years. 
Yeah. How can you how could you see your companion while this was all happening? Was was he able to visit? Were you together the whole time? No, no, no. Um, uh, we were very restricted in in going out. We didn't live together, so you could go out when it when it was closed down. You could go out only for like three hours in the morning to to get right. your food and and medication or what you needed. So it was very limited how much one could uh, one could see each other. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. And then yeah. it was a long time when I came back to Norway, of course, that we, we couldn't see each other. Yeah. Yeah. So and wow. then I could finally go back to Nepal last uh, November with all these CPR tests. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I was still a bit afraid because uh, the airport in Kathmandu just closed, you know, there were no flights out of Nepal. So I was kind of, <laughs> I was kind of stuck there and I, I would, didn't want that to happen again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think just just recently people are getting used to the idea of traveling yeah. again, and mm-hmm. and it's becoming a little easier once more without yeah. having to take all these tests and yeah, yeah, feeling like okay, airports aren't just going to shut down all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah it's not this immediate. Threat. Yeah, yeah. And so before, when you were living up in Nepal, you were like teaching yoga retreats and going hiking in the Himalayas. Yeah, which sounds I just, I amazing. Had it, I had it all planned so beautifully. I had, uh, I had, uh, I think 10, 10, 12 people signed up for a, yeah. what I call an Ashtanga yoga journey around the Kathmandu Valley. They were mm-hmm. just going to come at the end of uh, March. Yeah. And then everything closed down just from one week mm-hmm. to the next that became yeah. impossible to do. And that was kind of my yeah. favorite thing to do as well, you know. Yeah. You know, just have something you're really enthusiastic about all my favorite places i love to yeah. take people there and explain it and introduce yeah. them to another culture because quite often people go to nepal and they just end up taking pictures of things <laughs> yeah <laughs> without really understanding it and and you're always like uncertain what can i do can i actually walk into the temple to the buddhist right. temple and sit there or Mm-hmm. What is allowed? What is not allowed? Can I talk to mm-hmm. this person? So it's it's nice to 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 be able to introduce and say, okay, come yeah. here. I can show you around. You can sit down here. You can sit in yeah. with the in the morning prayers. And, uh, and people are so fascinated. And it's yeah. nice to be let into this uh, this world. And it's it's something I really like doing. Yeah, and to have and a guide everyone... who can translate for you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and everyone yeah, falls in love with Nepal and yeah and goes home changed mm-hmm. so it's a nice thing to do really and I I went to Tibet uh, a few years back and I had also mm. planned uh, I had actually planned uh, a trip to, uh, to take people into Lhasa and around and through wow. Tibet and around Mount Kailash yeah but then yeah everything just Close well down. next time when you do that trip you let me know because i really want to yeah. visit mount kailash <laughs> oh it's a wonderful it's a wonderful thing to do the whole experience of being in tibet was a complete yeah. game changer mm. wow what changed for you what did it open up you know from studying from it brought me one step closer to buddhism and the history and everything mm. i had studied over the year i got the realization that wow this actually happened this yeah. actually happened here yeah you know yeah. and also the uh, on also the extremely harsh conditions that people live under yeah so much is above uh, uh 4, meters which is extremely challenging for the yeah. for the for the body to just live in these conditions and and how could they do all these things like practicing this extreme yoga that they're practicing and 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 just mm-hmm. survive just survive in the cold and the snow and uh, and with less food mm. and and how could people in such harsh conditions develop such a spiritual practice that's kind of amazing yeah it is, yeah so it's really mm. impressive and you still see it how these uh, how these people are so devoted mm-hmm yeah, I think the, perhaps Always the harsh needed. conditions lend itself to those <laughs> to spiritual practice. Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. Did you ever do any um, 
like research or or learning about um, this idea that the Ashtanga yoga practice came from these more tantric Tibetan type yoga what was it called well i still i still have yeah. a dream yeah. of going into the archives in in Kathmandu mm. and uh, with an expert in navari language and find the yoga kurunta <laughs> ah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great mm. that would be great yeah because there are some some quite um, uh, big archives in in Kathmandu yeah. and i heard i i can't remember who said put up that uh, theory that um, this Raman Mohan that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Raman Acharya, yeah. Acharya might have been in the war mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which could make yeah. which could make sense you know but then mm -hmm. the text would be in the Wari language yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah interesting and there's like this yantra yoga is that what it's called yeah yatra yatra yoga yeah, yeah. i think something like yantra that yoga, yeah. Yantra, yeah, yoga. yantra yoga it, it's interesting to look at the similarities between that type of practice and the ashtanga the, yoga sequencing the, and the breathing and the uh the geometric shapes that make mm. the very very interesting similarities yeah they have um i mean they have <laughs> they have some very elaborate uh uh, practices within the the Tibetan tradition, and now it's it, now it's a very interesting time because now they are uh, released uh, for the ah. for the public because they were mm -hmm. always kept secret because this mm -hmm. was a non monastic tradition, so yeah. Uh, yeah. so uh, it was not for, uh, for everyone. It was for for the for the yogis. So these yeah. were two separate, always two separate traditions in uh, in uh, Tibet. But now it's 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 taught more openly, mm, so that's actually part of my my project these days. Yeah. So we, this year we invited uh, Ian Baker to uh, to Norway to lecture, mm -hmm. uh, and and he's like he's an expert on uh, on Tibetan yoga and a long long term uh, practitioner. Yeah. Uh, uh, and also with with references to how these practices are working on the on the body the nervous system the different yeah. uh, systems of the body so, tumo. And so That's, we, that was the word tumo the breathing tumo, the yes breathing yes practice. yeah the breathing exactly yeah. the inner heat so that's mm -hmm. that's happening next year now it's a bit of advertising here so yeah <laughs> actually, uh, so i did this uh, i had this that's dream amazing. i had yeah. this dream or this vision of putting together you know Ian Baker, who is a scholar practitioner and and an amazing uh, speaker and, and lecturer, mm -hmm. and uh, to put him and uh, a Tibetan Lama from from within the tradition to have them teach together, so mm -hmm. people would get amazing. the historical context and see it in relation to yoga and Hatha yoga, yeah. um, and the common roots in in tantra, and yeah. and at the same time people would get. Be deeply immersed in the practice from mm -hmm. from uh, from uh, uh, from someone within the tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the uh, the other teacher, Dolpa Tukur Rinpoche, he's from uh, uh, he's from uh, a village of uh, of yogis, and but then he also has a, a monastic uh, uh, education, uh, and uh, so you get all the aspects of the. Of the Tibetan tradition, because it's also it's also the case that uh, that the tantric practice is blended with the uh, with the monastic tradition, and they were yeah. altered. So uh, so you have really you have both in in Tibet. You have both the you know the yogis on one side and the monastic tradition on one side, but you also have a kind of a compromise in which the in which the or an adaptation in which the the uh, monastic uh, uh, the people who belong to the monastic tradition also get to practice to do these yogic practices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, that's that went well it was really yeah. you know it was kind of scary thing <laughs> to do yeah uh, to put the uh, to put this together and see how openly each of them would would reveal their view and their, their yeah. tradition but it went extremely well and uh, and we we got the we establish the the sense of trust, you know, because it's not, you know, you don't just reveal yeah. this to to anyone. You have to do it properly and make sure the kind of cons contextualization and explanations mm -hmm. are, you know, proper and 
come from a good place. So next year we're ready to to do the Tumo practice and get the initiation. So I'm very excited. That's happening in Norway. <laughs> wow. When is, when is that happening? Yeah, when? This is happening probably in July next year up at mm-hmm. Nursen. So we will be also out in, in nature. That was something else I thought would be very appropriate because, you know, these yogis, they quite often, they practice in remote places. So again, yeah. back to nature, practice yeah. in, in places. There's a whole tradition um, that Ian Baker is also uh, deeply in, engaged in. And that's these sacred places, finding these places that are extremely conducive to your practice that affects your mind and makes it easier, mm. facilitates meditation in which your perception of the landscape starts to change. Yeah. Become undifferentiated, like when you're on LSD. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you don't need to be on LSD. No, you don't need. It's (laughs) true. You don't need to be. Breathe deeply. The the practices are there available to everyone. Uh, Gosh, how could people sign up for something like that with you? Or or, are there practices that, that they could... They could learn well, I think this retreat, we, we just have to uh, establish, the, set the, the schedule and because these are, you know, Rinpoche is a busy teacher. So yeah. we just have to confirm the, t- con- confirm the timings and then it will be up on the, the Nelson website. Oh, perfect. The, which website? The Nelson website. Nelson. Nelson. Alex Medin's retreat Alex center. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I, I, uh, I wish I had uh, someone like that who could who could help me uh, as an introduction to to Buddhism or how to mm-hmm. to operate on a in a temple. I, I I remember when I was living in in Korea, I would go to the Bongwan Bongwansa Temple um, mm-hmm. on Bongwansa Mountain in in Seoul. And it's incredible in Seoul in Korea because the it feels like Buddhism is very much integrated into the urban society. So it's, mm. the temples are always quite close to where people mm. live. Mm. And it's helpful that the mountains are also very close to where people live. Mm. Um, and I would, I remember going into the temple every day, I would do my Ashtanga yoga practice, and I would walk up the hill and I'd go into the temple and sit and try and do a meditation practice as well. And I was never doing anything right. And <laughs> I'd go in, I think people would do prostrations and then leave. And I wanted to sit for a long time and the cleaning lady and I started to feud and <laughs> she would start to sweep all around me until I would leave like I was garbage, you know, that needed to leave the <laughs> yeah. temple. And she had to kind of, I can't clean here until you leave, you know? Mm. And so was, I, I needed a translator and someone to really mm. help me figure out exactly. what to do in that room. It's hard yeah. to get on the mm. inside of these uh, traditions and they can also be confused, confusing because it's like a big ocean and wherever you dip your toe, it's going to feel different because mm-hmm. they have developed over hundreds and hundreds of years and they can be contradictory yeah you know? yeah the buddha mm-hmm. said one thing in one context and uh, a few centuries later it seems to something contradictory mm-hmm. seems to come up it's reinterpreted in a, in a different way yeah so it's really important to have this someone who can contextualize it and, and explain it to you mm-hmm. so that was the good thing about the education in in Kathmandu that we've got both uh, perspectives mm. but then when it comes to practice it's also good to have both uh, perspectives yeah without there being any contradiction mm-hmm. yeah yeah amazing oh. wonderful and do you have any more retreats planned for for going up to Nepal and doing yoga and trekking through uh, the mountains I have, yes I actually have another kind of dream retreat yeah, and I guess that's the fun thing about you know. Uh, I thought it was fun as a dancer to to plan projects yeah. and kind of dream up something and and write a description and then materialize it. Yeah, uh, and plan it and get it all together. It's a kind of fun part. And uh, same thing with uh, with planning amazing retreats, you know. And you can mm-hmm. you can do it in uh, in Nepal. Because it's uh, it's well developed for tourism. It's quite mm-hmm. it's well organized. Of course, there are things you never know if there's going to be a, a road, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a bump in the road or something. Suddenly the road is closed or something is yeah. happening like that. 
or a big festival and the road is blocked by dancing people or something like that <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, uh, but apart from that Nepal is uh, well organized and the unforeseen sort of becomes the charm of Nepal also you mm. have to you have to be up for that for the surprises yeah. mm. uh, so I have a retreat planned in October and this was always my dream to do first uh, retreat out in uh, uh, in the beautiful countryside in a wonderful setting in a holy place mm. and then go trekking go for the mountain experience yeah. uh, and both things are really wonderful to do in uh, in Nepal of course the the mountains are wonderful but you're also immersed in this culture so when you go yeah. trekking you also come across little monasteries and villages and practitioners yeah. and it's really, uh, and you're walking on old trade roads, routes, yeah. you know, so it's part of the, it's always part of the culture and staying in Kathmandu for a couple of days, that's also like a sacred space in the midst of all the chaos and <laughs> disorganization and bumpy roads and the worst infrastructure ever, you are <laughs> actually within a mandala where everything has significance. Yeah. So... Um, you can you can see it on the outside or you could tr really try to see under the surface mm -hmm. and there's always the different times present at the same time you're in the modern time but you're also in medieval time and ancient time yeah uh, so that's a, a wonderful thing to do and there is also now so it's a it's actually a lack of retreat places in in uh, in nepal at the moment there aren't that many nice mm. retreat places but there is one so yeah. that's where we go <laughs> that's where we again go. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful yeah that's, and again you, that's, can, uh, you can find that on the nelson website or your no, website. that's on my website that's on the ashtanga nepal website so that's okay. on the retreats in nepal so i have a yeah i have a two-week uh, retreat slash trek in nepal <laughs> and uh, i i will probably go to nepal like uh, twice a year i think from now on mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. keep the uh, connection with that place and now it's so wonderful my my students are um, there are two nepali students they have taken over the shala so they are actually they're continuing the mysore program and Amazing. i think it's so nice and i think it's so cool that it's the nepali people themselves yeah. doing that. you know it's yeah. beautiful so i i taught them and and now they are they are continuing continuing and they're so dedicated yeah amazing mm. that's so nice mm. and nice mm. to also see something that you started living on and like being mm. taken up by the people who are who are yeah. there who have their yeah, roots yeah. there and yeah. because they are nepali more nepali yeah uh, people are coming to their classes also right yeah yeah that's amazing that's that's mm. incredible is uh, I just want to say it's really lovely sitting with you. It's um, <laughs> it just there's a very kind of um, um, I'm thinking uh, beneficial or bene. Just the word bene is bene. is coming to my bene. Yeah, there's the, the bene. coming to my <laughs> the kind of wonderful um. Um, sense of of uh, positivity from you and, and uh, a kind of a feeling of uh, of nonviolence. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's just the kind of that's the the feeling that I get. I'm trying to think of the right word that I want to use, but it's um it's uh, bhavana bhavana. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of lovely sense of being, and uh, yeah, it, it's a. Uh, it's a lovely experience to sit with you and talk with you. Well, thank you. And I, I think I have softened over the years. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard from students that they used to be afraid of me, that I used to be kind of fierce. Yeah. yeah. And kind when of, we were younger. Of, you, you want that, you know, when you are a, you, when you are a dedicated a stronger practitioner yourself yeah. you don't you know realize oh why can't they get up at four in the morning and yeah. why can't they be as dedicated and I as I am mm -hmm. you know and yeah. then you realize that you know people have lives they have other yeah yeah exactly Just let them do what they do and and the yoga will still do them some really good yeah so yeah I'm not so uh 
yeah i'm not that fierce anymore but i really still believe in the in the system that it's it's really wonderful for people it's a fast track mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fast oh. track to self-empowerment and, and embodiment and so many good yeah effects. how and have you been able to, to combine like your own personal practice of ashtanga yoga that physical very physical side of the practice with then like a meditation practice do you have two separate times where you're dedicating to these two traditions or benevolent Benevolent. that was the word that i was i was thinking of you were such a benevolent person that's how i feel go ahead um yeah to be honest i don't really have a very much of a sitting practice uh so when i was in uh, when i was studying uh yeah. avana can mean so many things so i had to take the the study as uh, as my practice you know yeah. it's also one part of practice is to go through these trains of thoughts again and again and in the mm-hmm. end it alters your perception of the of the world uh so i guess that was the that was the path now mm-hmm. uh uh, and and then for for periods of time you also have these practices that you do that are uh, you know uh, reciting you know aspirational mm-hmm. prayers and uh, and um, uh, visualization and repeating mantras and uh, mm-hmm. and kind of formal liturgies like that that you are uh, that you are practicing uh, over time. Uh, which we are not so familiar with in the in the west uh but i had to do it a lot because i was when i was in the monastery that's the way i was taught i was they taught me in a very traditional way the way they would teach a six-year-old you know? right and then <laughs> yeah. i was a 46 year old yeah <laughs> or at least in my 40s yeah uh, so i think the thing is that you you do this and you have these liturgies, these prayers, these aspirations is a really big part of the practice. They always do it. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I'm thinking a lot about that, how we in the West, we don't do that. We just mm. sit down on our on our cushion and we attempt to control the mind. Mm-hmm. You actually have to set your aspiration first. You have to lift the energy. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. Um, it's an, uh, you have to inspire yourself. Yeah. And it's all, in that way, it's also it's also physical. It also affects your your system, you know. Mm-hmm. So to do these uh, prayers or recite this liturgy, you always you try really to let them blend with the energy of your of your body, so that yeah. it means something. It's not just like lip service or uh, yeah. repeating some meaningless words. In yeah. the Tibetan tradition, you should be very aware all the time, and your intention is everything. Mm-hmm. So you really have to try to to make that intention very clear and do it in 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 so many ways by going through it logically well is there really such thing as you know the cause and effect and should i really be is there really a reason to be altruistic and try to save other beings from suffering and so Mm -hmm. on and so on you go through this in a very rational way and and then you approach it from a more like emotional way from a devotional way Mm. like i really want to i really want to make the world better i really want to remove suffering and then you make your aspirations and then it's good only then it's good to have that framework for your practice then Mm. it's helpful yeah that was the thing that i took away from by the coupe the most striking image is the the hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of of monks um debating logic Mm-hmm. with each other and yeah. talking of, and defending their position just as though they were in a philosophy class mm-hmm. and logic and argument and counter argument and then the the slap yeah, yeah. as they win an argument yeah. and it's, it's a sort of phenomenal thing to observe yeah. and to you're really kind of struck by the sense of uh, of intellect that mm. this is a these are intellectual arguments that people mm. are making on the state of being and it's and a way incredible. of learning you know to make the to make the teachings really stick you have mm. to sometimes uh, adopt the the op- opposite uh, um, the opposite view. position of what you believe in mm. and defend it you know yeah. mm. so it's a it's a really wonderful way of learning i think i wish we'd do it <laughs> we should do it in western academia yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. So my, my it's a very is, philosophical way of learning. You know, that's yeah, what yeah. they teach you in philosophy always is you, if, whatever position you're arguing for, you have to make counter arguments from another position and, mm -hmm. and then counter those counter arguments with, mm -hmm. you know, your, your own position or whatever yeah. sort of. And that was always yeah. part of the tradition as well to study the other traditions that you didn't mm -hmm. agree with. You know, you should be educated. If you're a Buddhist, you should also know the Samkhya tradition and the other right. systems. Yeah. Yeah. You, speaking of which, you've, you've also kind of started exploring uh, a different way of doing Ashtanga yoga. And the, you've been doing, you've been working in the, the Sun tradition, of the Batabi Joyce's tradition of mm. Ashtanga yoga. And now you've been exploring the the moon tradition, the opposite. And I, yes, I wonder if you could so well. <laughs> talk more about, about that, because that seems to have also opened up your, um, your teaching to something less orthodox and yeah. less... Uh... Well, I kind of had to, because I thought I would be superwoman and I would do Ashtanga till I was 85 at least. And, you know, I thought, thought I was invincible, but that but what I wasn't, so I, I basically, I just ruined my shoulders and I got mm. almost like frozen shoulders. And uh, I think I, I always prefer the strength aspect of yoga as opposed to mm. the, um, to, you know, back when bending and, mm -hmm. and mobility. And uh, I, uh, I guess I didn't have a very balanced uh, practice. And mm -hmm. then one day I just couldn't lift my arms anymore. Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. I basically just lost my practice and mm -hmm. that was completely, it was devastating, you know, and humiliating, humiliating yeah. to, you know, mm -hmm. to teach and not be able to do the, the things you were teaching. I'm familiar. So, so I felt that sense of, of loss and uh, mm -hmm. um, I didn't know, I didn't know what, to, what to do. Everything just hurts. Uh, so, uh, so someone just made me aware of, well, maybe you should try the Chanda Namaskar of, of Matthew Sweeney for a while. Mm -hmm. So I did that and, uh, that was such, you know, it's such a relief sometimes, you know, oh, I, I can actually go, I can get up in the morning and I can do something I look forward to doing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do the things that hurt. Yes. Yeah. My, my practice. Everything I tried to do in, I couldn't do trikonasana because it was painful to just lift the arm up. Yeah. yeah. So it was that bad. Mm -hmm. So I found something that I I could do, and I had a you know big experience from that. That even in my fifties, the the body would still change, and I would actually be much more flexible than before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so that also made me more comfortable about giving people alternative stuff to do right uh, you can you i think we can use the ashtanga in in so many ways but you know many students who are not so dedicated they end up never getting beyond primary series and a half primary and they yeah. end up doing that for years and years and years i don't think mm -hmm. it was meant to be done that way i think no. you should have a balanced practice and have mm -hmm. a bit of uh, the opposite as well Mm -hmm. go into deeper back bendings and uh, do other things working the nervous system in a totally different way mm -hmm. so it changed my way of teaching and looking more about into what does this student need you know and it's better mm -hmm. that they come in and they practice if they have an injury and lots of people have that sitting by computers all the time they have like stiff shoulders and mm -hmm. all kinds of problems or they tear a hamstring or something <laughs> of the forward bending yeah. and I'll just encourage them to come in and just practice you know you yeah. have permission you've done this for years and years you can you can do something for something different different for a while mm -hmm. and it might even add to your practice yeah so yeah. I feel a bit um, a bit less uh, traditional yeah <laughs> but i'm still I, uh, you know i'm still very passionate about people practice they should practice so you have to find the way that the each student can, can mm -hmm. practice yeah yeah I, I know that 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 sensation the, that <clears throat> i've got a, a group of students in my room who um for whatever reason need a more deviant approach <laughs> and 
uh, I need to kind of work with with some their limitations and help them with these limitations and uh, an unorthodox approach is is what's necessary mm. for them because they may have a you know um, herniations or mm. uh, they may have a um, a immune immune disorder mm. and you need to work with them and and yet still because we were we, you know we we're trained in this kind of cultish orthodoxy <laughs> if someone else comes in the room some friend old friend from the old days and like i'm still and they're going to sub my class i'm still like embarrassed like, <laughs> mm, I, yeah, yeah i made I some ma- i made yeah. some little changes i'm sorry you have to kind of work <laughs> with these people and, and that we shouldn't be embarrassed at all these mm. people needed our help and so we had to do something different for them i think that it's more open now though i think that more people are realizing or at least understanding that that the yoga is to work with each person and each body type and Mm -hmm. it's not about sacrificing people to a system it's about using the system to help people i i say that to people you know the the practice is for you it's not you who are there for the practice yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and of course people are different if you have like a 20 year old very ambitious yeah like <laughs> strong mm, yeah. you can push them <laughs> yeah. exactly. then the beatings can come yeah. they end up in mm. Vipariti shalabhasana and they're like how did i get yeah, here, did I get here? <laughs> and they even enjoy that you know yeah so yeah why that's not? right yeah, yeah exactly yeah, my nepali student is like that he's unstoppable i mean yeah. he's like yeah so why not why not exactly yeah there's a there's a time and a season for all things right absolutely (laughs) absolutely but now it's so many of my students uh, you know i started in 2002 i think and Mm -hmm. and then i was gone for a long time and now i opened the meister program again a year ago Mm -hmm. and some of the old students are coming back and i'm i'm just amazed that they're still doing it you know and yeah why shouldn't i teach them in a way that you know that they can benefit Mm -hmm. from absolutely yeah they've been at it that time that's that's just amazing in itself yeah no it's incredible Mm. yeah well thank you again for spending time with us ellen it was really it's really lovely to spend time with your kind of benevolent energy (laughs) Um, thank you it's so nice to share some of your story it's such a unique experience to have like you know, living in Bella Coupe and Nepal and like, you know, learning Tibetan and integrating these two beautiful traditions together to help people in their spiritual practices. I think it's, it's such a beautiful path that you've been yeah. on. And so, yeah, thank finally, you, for sharing. you know, in, in this time of my life, it's, it seems like it's all coming together, really. Yeah, yeah. All the, weird or bad career choices <laughs> so, all these yeah. things that you know people are why are you doing that yeah. going off to study Tibetan. But yeah. for me it's completely the opposite when i lived in Kathmandu, i felt like i was in the center of the world yeah mm-hmm. really not in the outskirts you know it's yeah. Where yeah. the traditions are surviving totally it's totally vibrant. It's, it's really this you know the spirit yeah the i feel the yeah. same about Spiritual calgary center. that it is the center of the world uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> <in> calgary. <laughs> no. <laughs> no yeah no it's it's amazing it's so it's so wonderful so mm. yeah well i hope to join you one day on one of You'd, your pilgrimages i would love to go on a track <laughs> absolutely yeah we'll get the yeah we get the mount kailash back on the schedule yes you let me know (laughs) i'm there you know chinese government to open Uh, i know but i think it's opening now i think yeah maybe another year or two it'll be be ready (laughs) alex has been eager for us to come to norway to visit yeah i'd love to come back too Mm-hmm. yeah come visit yeah. sometime yeah next next july next exactly. july for the tumo breathing for the tumo breathing yeah. Yeah. Yes. that would be nice absolutely i've been talking about Nothing. tumo in my slideshow for years yeah so to actually oh, yeah. experience it It'd be amazing yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well it was so beautiful and we'll have all of the links to all of your things in the show notes so people Wonderful. can find you yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much thanks for inviting me my pleasure